like to uh, thank the organizers for organizing such wonderful mission and for Mike for providing the presentation. Uh, I'm really happy that in my career uh, I crossed paths with Mike and uh, all of that experience and including the conference here uh, was very inspirational to, uh, to me personally. And, um, I only hope that uh, it will continue and grow. Uh, so, this talk will be about homological algebra of knots. Uh, we won't see uh, too much of category theory, because we won't see usual good old homological algebra and spectral sequences. Uh, that's as far as we're going to go. But in the same time, we'll see many connections to other fields, and in particular, most of what I'm going to tell you is inspired by um, some physical picture that I'll try to present in a mathematical language. And this is very much in the spirit of uh, Mike, who is now both physicist and mathematician at the same time. So uh, we'll be also going in between different areas uh, in this talk, only in mathematics, I won't actually uh, talk about physics here. Uh, but the areas in mathematics that we're going to touch are quite distant uh, from each other, and each one has life of its own, has its own developments and breakthroughs. And what's interesting is that breakthroughs in one area will be intimately connected with, the one, with those in other areas. And uh, today we'll mostly talk about non-homologies on one hand, enumerative invariants and counting something on the other hand. And um, I'll touch a little bit on gauge theory and instant phone counting. Um, probably this part will be mentioned only, only briefly. Um, and these connections, as I say, they go hand in hand. And I was planning to show you more, more slides motivating these connections. But uh, thanks to Peter's wonderful introduction yesterday, uh, I don't think I can do any better, so I'll just uh, base uh, this motivation on his lecture yesterday and proceed uh, to, to the deeds of my talk. So I'll start with a very uh, area very different from uh, not theory. So we'll start with enumerative side. And the reason I want to do it is just to show you how easy it is uh, to start some simple calculations. And in fact, in 10 minutes, we'll be able to uh, reconstruct covenant homology and even generalizations and get new predictions by doing some simple algebra. It won't even require calculus. It will be just counting. And uh, for most of the calculations, counting with our 10 fingers will be sufficient. And um, that, that will lead us to uh, some answers, which of course then need to be explained. And that will be the rest of my talk. So first, I'll start with a very simple problem of counting two-dimensional partitions all know from, say, game of Tetris or otherwise. Um, here is a sample of two-dimensional partitions, also known as young tableaus, organized by their size. So the natural question you can ask is, how many partitions, uh, two-dimensional partitions, can you possibly have composed out of, say, n squares? Uh, we'll call it as these partitions of size n. Only that there is one of size one, two of size two, three of size three, and so on and so forth. We can easily uh, organize uh, this table. And again, uh, this is something you can explain to a 10 year old kid, and they'll probably be able to count for you at least several terms in the generating function, which of course is known as better function. So in the generating function, uh, written in terms of variable q, uh, Exponent is the size, and coefficient in front of the, each single term tells us how many uh, partitions, two-dimensional partitions of this given size, one can possibly have. So this is a very simple counting problem. And again, it's an easy exercise to verify, say, term by term that this is correct, or even sum it up in the full generating function. So a little bit more interesting and slightly more challenging problem, but Still, something you can do on the back of the envelope is to count, count three dimensional partitions. Now, you should think of this picture as a corner of the room where you put in square boxes, just like we did in two dimensions by putting squares and organizing it in a three dimensional partition. And 
existence of such three-dimensional young tableau, in quotes, uh, is defined by inequalities, which essentially say that uh, boxes should not fall. So for example, you cannot put additional boxes out here where there is no support for them. So again, the way to visualize this is by uh, stacking a pile of boxes in the corner of the room, and that defines the reason for the reasonable inequalities. And uh, given such three-dimensional partition phi, you can naturally define its volume in this case, or size, again, as the number of boxes, or the number of boxes that you can have. And because problem now is three-dimensional, uh, of course, with a given size, you have slightly more choices. And the function that you get grows a little faster. So in other words, the coefficients of q and powers control size, but coefficients control number of possibilities. So the coefficients grow a little faster. So instead of a single product of 1 minus q to the k, which is basically the eta function, you now get also the same uh, factor here, but also to the power of k. So that uh, is responsible for the fact that we have three dimensions and the counting problem has more solution. Again, uh, signing it up, again, is, is a little exercise that um, requires a little bit of work. But if you're given the thumbs are verifying the, that this is correct, it's actually uh, very nice and type of exercise that you can teach a uh, 10-year-old. And um, you can easily recover this uh, first uh, three or four terms in this in this system. Now, let's go to uh, modern mathematics. And uh, to make the problem a little bit more interesting, and this is the last uh, step and uh, level of complexity that I'm increasing in this enumerator or counting problem, uh, we'll be counting what in the works uh, is called skew three-dimensional partition. So skew three-dimensional partition is essentially the same three-dimensional partition we just discussed, equipped with a little bit of extra structure. Namely, one can slice three-dimensional partitions along diagonal planes. Say, if this is xy plane, then um, you can slice the three-dimensional partitions by diagonals, which uh, have a trivial vertical extent when you go over these diagonals in the xy plane. And then you notice the following. First of all, three-dimensional partitions splits into sequence of two-dimensional young tableaus, the usual 2D uh, partitions indicated here on the picture. And in the same time, the support of this three-dimensional partition is also a two-dimensional partition itself. And then we can do the following. Given the information about support in the plane, indicated by the shaded area here, uh, we can slice it like this and color the diagonals depending whether we have left turn or right turn in this two-dimensional partition. So therefore, we'll have colors blue and that red lines associated to these diagonals. And given that, we can actually put different weights for two-dimensional length tableaus, which happen to be either on blue or red diagonal. So th there is a very simple combinatorial rule. And what I just described, our combinatorial plan is called skew 3D partition. And again, there are two colors or two types of slices that we get, which we can weigh with different variables, Q and T. So as a result, uh, now repeating this counting problem, we get something more interesting. We get a function, which is a function of two variables, q and t. And if you wish, it's a two-variable generalization of the McMahon function, which we saw on the previous slide. But again, this is a very um, simple counting problem. And, uh, but it, it's, uh, we're approaching the modern days and much more interesting challenging problems, uh, which culminates here. We can do the following. In addition to this three-dimensional partition counting, we can try to define the boundary conditions uh, and make the function really interesting and really complicated. So assume that uh, in the problem that we're trying to solve, there are already some boxes uh, set in the corner of the room which go along the three uh, axes of the often positive often in the three-dimensional space. And obviously, such boundary conditions can be labeled by two-dimensional partitions, uh, which represent the cross-section in x, y, and uh, z direction here. So each one is a two-dimensional 
and that's all. And now we can start putting boxes on top of uh, whatever is already present, defined by the boundary conditions. And of course, the answer, how many boxes I can put of different size, will now depend on three boundary conditions set at infinity. As a result, you get a very interesting function which depends on three uh, two-dimensional tables on three two-dimensional diagrams. Uh, and two variables q and t, just as in the previous case. So uh, repeating the same problem as before with the boundary conditions, we'll do the same slicing, and there'll be two variables q and t, which keep track of how many uh, boxes or two-dimensional intervals we have on red and blue slices, for example. The function that we enter is much more interesting than any of the answers you've seen before, and this is um, the final point and top my counting problem that I wanted to describe. Uh, it's very interesting, and even from a mediocorial point of view, quite non-trivial. It's been in mathematics literature studied by Oppenkopf, Oliver Schuttekin from here in Berkeley, and um, the picture I'm presenting is from uh, their joint paper with uh, Hubert Bachmann, which relates uh, this setup, uh, which is purely combinatorial, to something I'm going to explain later. Uh, Q and T refer to uh, the same definition as uh, on the previous slide. So we take three-dimensional partition now, it's, it will be a little weird because it will start not from the bottom, but from whatever is already preset in the picture, from boundary conditions that we specify. But then we, again, break uh, symmetric S3 symmetry of the picture by slicing it in one of the directions, for example, taking an xy plane as a preferred plane, making these diagonal slices. And then essentially what we do, we count, uh, for example, this partition will be uh, exponent, will, be, will contribute to the t, this will contribute to the q, and vice and so on and so forth. So depending on whether two-dimensional partition happens to be on the blue line, on the blue diagonal, or red diagonal, we'll have an uh, assignment of either t or t. So the rule is the following. Uh, it's easier to uh, see, it's essentially determined by the direction in which uh, this uh, two-dimensional um, boundary of the two-dimensional Yankov, which is the support of this picture, is going. So it's easy to figure out it from the um, outer conditions here, uh, away from the diagram. If the line goes to the right from the corner, we say that it's a red line. If the line goes down, it's a blue line. And uh, there are no options. So it's a very simple combinatorial rule. Again, this is what our combinatorial friends call skew partition. In the next slide, uh, you can go to the next slide. Yes. Oh yes, that's correct. So uh, right. So the condition analogous to what I just explained in the previous slide, where uh, what's red and what's blue was determined only by the support, here you're absolutely right, if I understand it correctly. It does depend on the boundary conditions as well. But there is a very natural generalization, which I don't want to go into detail, but it's again called uh, skew two-dimensional partitions with boundaries. And but again the rule varies. So this is a typical phenomenon where starting with a very simple definition, typical to say for number theory or many other problems and not theory, we get an interesting complicated object. In this case, uh, this function, I'll call it P for partition generating function, is fairly interesting and contains a lot of uh, useful information. But the definition, again, is very simple. We can start by a compounding process and easily reconstruct several of these terms. Now, I want to uh, combine two such problems, uh, put them together, and consider uh, if you wish two corners of the room, uh, here and here, um, and consider two such problems, 
which are connected by infinite length, uh, infinite length of um, some two-dimensional partitions, or uh, it could be finite or infinite, depends on the uh, problem at hand. And now we'll try to combine all the details, all the information from the previous slide. In particular, we'll allow boundary conditions, and now there are four boundaries for uh, infinite uh, corners here where we can specify two-dimensional ensembles, two-dimensional partitions, depending on how this picture asymptotes to infinity. So for simplicity here, I'll mark it with a trivial partition, trivial partition meaning that there shouldn't be any boxes asymptoting to infinity. Uh, I'll put one-dimensional ensemble of a single box, um, mm -hmm. and the same here on these two bags. And then we'll be doing again counting as, as before, uh, Slicing each corner with a Q and T, uh, it's actually possible to make it completely compatible in between the two corners. And now there is actually a third variable A, which will be keeping track of how many uh, boxes we have in a two-dimensional partition, which is obtained by slicing this diagram. Uh, in other words, what is the size of the cross section here in the middle? So we can formulate such a problem. And now the result will depend on three variables. It will depend on variable A, which controls the cross section, and variables Q and T, which control uh, red and uh, blue slices and people. So, yes? this a little bit, but again, I prefer to give it up because this is one of the details which uh, I think visually is here what's happening, but uh, in detail I have to specify a little bit, but uh, uh, yes, you, you don't fix it, exactly, that's, that's the point, and uh, of course they have to share the same cross section, so they have to ask both centers to the same thing. So it's literally using two of the problems of the previous slide and say putting them together, requiring that here there is an actual doing of the boundary. So again, just to uh, keep things simple and clear, uh, let's uh, look at the example here. Uh, this is some particular choice of coloring where uh, two boundary conditions are non-trivial, specified by the simplest possible young table in two dimensions, maybe a simple square or box. And uh, I'll put empty boundary conditions here. As a result, you get some function which depends on all of the three variables. Uh, I'll call it P for, again, counting partitions. It depends on boundary conditions here and here. And it involves A's, Q's, and T's. And again, uh, it's, uh, if you wish, much more complicated version of the second function that we saw before. Uh, and a priori by staring at this answer, which again you can reproduce simply by counting, uh, seeing that it, it can be summed up on this series, of course, is not easy, but if you know the answer, verifying several few terms, uh, of course, is very easy. That can be done on the micro envelope. But the answer so far doesn't look terribly illuminating. Uh, in particular, we don't see uh, any structure yet. But here is the first surprise. If you take this function of three variables, a, q, and t, and specialize to t equals minus one, what you obtain is a Hopley polynomial of a Hopley. So this is standard expression for polynomial invariant, which uh, I'll remind you in a moment, uh, which is obtained by simply specifying the previous answer to value t equals minus one. Now, Oh, uh, here A refers to um, 
dimensional Jensen group, and suppose it has uh, some size k, not a number of squares, right? So Jensen law of norm k. Then uh, I will have a contribution which behaves as at a k, and then whatever else. So the power of a, just like in the previous generating function, uh, tells you how many uh, two-dimensional squares you have in a cross-section. So uh, the specialization that we're going to do next essentially says, uh, let's treat two variables, q and t, which we saw before, corresponding to red lines and blue lines, very asymmetrically, namely we'll uh, give up on counting with respect to t, essentially setting it to minus one. But we'll keep uh, blue lines, and uh, we'll keep the information about cross-section. So that's the specialization. function 
of A, Q, and T that we define by, by this count. It depends on three variables and has the following property. That if you set T equals minus one, you recover company. If you set A equals Q to the N, well, which happens only in case where N is equal to two, but uh, as you may anticipate it will work more generally, if you set A equals Q to the N, you obtain uh, one parental nominal over of the SLM non-homology. And therefore, just by staring at this diagram, where the horizontal arrows correspond to uh, setting T equals minus one, and vertical arrows correspond to specializing uh, to SLM by taking A equals Q to the N, uh, you quickly conclude that probably T is one parabola polynomial of some pretty graded homology. So there are three variables here, and probably they, uh, their exponents simply encode three gradients. Uh, yes. These are just for Hopkins. Uh, you're asking if this works only for Hopkins? Yeah. Uh, of course, I wouldn't be telling you the story if it works only for coffee. Yeah. There, is, there is, of course, a reason why it works, and uh, that, that is my goal to explain why. But um, indeed, I started uh, from the answer, telling you what the answer is, just to illustrate uh, how simple it is to do this counting and to produce results which happen to agree with well known expressions. In fact, in a moment, I'll try to draw some lessons from it. So, the first lesson we're drawing is that, again, Whatever sits here in the corner, uh, by its properties, which we just uh, noticed here, it should be probably from correctly on all of the cryptic graded homology. And of course, operation where we said t equals minus one on the horizontal arrows is nothing but taking for the characteristic. So then, the right way to think about the diagram on the previous slide is that here in the right column, we have homology groups as a doubly graded, as in SLM theory, which includes common up homology, or cryptic graded, as in something that we're about to explore. And in our left uh, side of this line, we have corresponding polynomials, which can be obtained by taking uh, the characteristics and then vertically by specializing to SLM. So this is a nice lesson. And at least so far, we seem to be understanding the meaning of these three variables, A, Q, and T, uh, which we'll explore further in this talk. But, um, Let's focus uh, on another aspect of the counting problem that we defined, namely on the boundary conditions. Remember, in the previous um, exercise, I decided to take very simple boundary conditions here specified by two-dimensional Young diagrams, which consist of a single square, which if you draw the symmetric representations of the symmetric group to representations of SLM, correspond to defining our fundamental representation. So what did I get? if I decide to choose different boundary condition, say two-dimensional partition with a single box as before, that would probably correspond to an n-dimensional representation of SLM. But then I can choose slightly more interesting um, young tableau on the other leg. And uh, as I say, the counting problems become, becomes more interesting. In fact, the phenomenon I mentioned in, the previous, in one of the previous questions where powers of A increase and the complexity of the formula increases as you increase the boundary conditions is very well illustrated here. So if whatever I'm explaining to you works, uh, what we should expect from this picture is that uh, this counting function encodes uh, information about pretty graded homology, but of a Hopkins colored by representations uh, which are fundamental and dimensional representation and anti-symmetric representation. So if you specialize, for instance, to uh, q to the 4, a equals q to the 4, as on the previous slide, we explained that this should be SL4 homology. But now, uh, that previous uh, answer, which was on the previous slide, gives you um, these generators for SL4 homology of the Hopkins colored by these two uh, young diagrams, again, corresponding to n-dimensional fundamental representation on one component and anti-symmetric uh, representation on the second component. I don't know if any uh, other technologists come out to complete the answer. Um, now, currently, there are various ways to con construct um, homological invariants for more general groups 
is a very simple counting problem. Again, you can teach it to a 10-year-old kid and build them and involve calculus that involve counting and mostly counting very simple objects. Of course, uh, proper understanding is uh, relates to a lot of good combinatorics. But whatever it is, it's an answer. So that we should ask, what is the question? Uh, and how does this counting problem come about? What does it really come from? It comes from geometry. And in fact, the calculation which I presented to you came much later. So at first, um, there was a geometric uh, realization of uh, non homologies which, I'm trying, which I'll try to explain. And uh, development of enumerative invariants uh, to which it was related um, only happened in the past couple of years. And therefore, the calculation which I just presented was not even available um, at the time when the Kuhlman uh, and Albert Schwartz we proposed interpretation of non homologies in terms of counting certain objects uh, in string theory. We don't have to know much about uh, string theory for, um, for this uh, purposes of this talk. All we have to know is that it requires 10 dimensions. And many of the aspects which um, the theory has, I can explain just by uh, using this fact. The 10 dimensions are used in the following way. Uh, you, find, you put string theory on a 10 dimensional manifold, which is a direct product of C2, two dimensional complex space, and three dimensional Calabiga manifold. This is actually a very typical setup that string theorists use to obtain the realistic models of particle physics from string theory. The reason is that uh, you take some curved space here, Calabiga, and you're left with non compact, a uh, big four dimensional space, which we can think of as four-dimensional space-time where we uh, So this problem and this particular geometry uh, came into uh, string theory and uh, mirror symmetry motivated by uh, realizing models of particle physics, nothing, nothing to do with knots. Now, in this interpretation of knot homologies, which I'll explain to you, uh, there are several ways to look at the problem. And it's very typical of physics or in string theory, you may have different ways to approach the same system. So if you look at this problem from the viewpoint of the Calabi-L threefold, you'll be studying counting holomorphic curves and eventually partitions that I just explained. You can also look at the problem from the uh, viewpoint of the uncompact space C2. Uh, C2 is a particular four manifold, and if you ask uh, how does this counting problem here translate or can be viewed from the viewpoint of the C2, uh, it will translate in a certain problem of instant form counting, and uh, actually a covariant instant form counting, um, which uh, we developed recently with my student Dimofte and uh, Walter Holland. Uh, the approach here was mainly based on the uh, viewpoint of the Calabial, and um, recently, thanks to work of Admitten, we have yet another third physical interpretation of this from the viewpoint of a certain Debray. So it's a kind of hybrid. It counts the same objects, but again, in all of these viewpoints, which is very typical in physics, we can look at the same object in many different ways. So here, counting is counting of homomorphic curves. Here, counting is counting of instant curves. And uh, in Edward's description, it's a kind of hybrid between the two. You're counting the same things, but viewed as solutions of partial uh, differential equations in prior dimensions, which in physics we would say it's described some gauge theory on a D-brain, which is closely connected to uh, this other project. And um, I hope I've already explained to you uh, this feature in, in his talk on Tuesday. And for the purposes of uh, my talk, I'll focus mainly on the uh, viewpoint of the cloud fold since uh, I already explained to you part of the story, um, I'll stay within this framework. But I want to point out that, uh, as usual in physics, you can approach the same problem from many different angles and get different descriptions of the same question. Uh, some have uh, their weaknesses, and some have their strength in different areas, and that's, of course, uh, uh, a common character. Now, let me. Already from the general setup that uh, you saw on the previous slide, I can explain some of the points of the construction and some of the general features. So just 
that is my client. Let's focus on the conceptual points and leave the details out uh, so we have a big holistic picture first. Uh, this problem has quite a number of symmetries, and the best you can hope for is that if you ask a billion group T2, the one cross one acting on T2, and uh, the product of real ones acting on the Columbia of X, in that case it would be called toric Columbia, if it enjoys such a torus action. And it turns out that first symmetry, well, C2 is always going to be part of our geometry and part of, and therefore part of the symmetry will be this T2 action. But the second one will be only a symmetry for torus knots, for torus leaf. And if Columbia is toric, and we're talking about torus knots and torus links, as I'll explain in a moment, usual localization techniques in enumerative geometry will immediately tell you that uh, localiza localization with respect to this three torus action will reduce the problem to counting three dimensional partitions which correspond to the fixed points of this torus action. So the reason we're counting three D partitions has to do with the fact that there is a three torus acting. And in my example for the fault link, uh, that's the reason I chose it, uh, it preserved the symmetry with respect to T3 action. The same property will work for all other torus knots and torus. This symmetry on the other hand is present always for any knot and for any link. Uh, knots, information about knots will stay in this part of the geometry. But this torus action is also very important. It's also, if it's present for any knot, and the corresponding equivariant parameters, if you do a cover counting in this part, are exactly our variables Q and T. So at least two of the variables, which we call Q and T, corresponding to the Q grading and homological grading, are visible in geometry very simply as part of the definition of the equivariant problem here. Very good. So that, as I say, the rest of the talk is supposed to be pedagogical introduction to what, what we're counting. In fact, in one of the slides, I'll have exactly this question. But uh, let me go slowly. And first, uh, I'll try to define the problem to, uh, as I say, that there, are, there are several ways to define the problem depending on how you look at this physics uh, system. Uh, my approach will be mostly from the cloud now. So uh, essentially, I'll forget about everything that's happening in this other part of the geometry. And um, we'll, we'll do um, some counting here. But first, I want to tell you how information about the knot can be translated in this geometry. And then we'll be able to formulate a suitable question. Before we do this, I want to point out that uh, in this framework, just as we saw with the example of the Hulk link, uh, there'll be very easy generalization to more general classic numbers and the exceptional groups and representations. So I already showed you an example of the homology, say SL4 homology with anti-symmetric representation, and there'll be more of it which naturally pops out from this approach. Another thing that it suggests is a generalization to three manifolds, but I have to say that at least from the Calabi-Yau viewpoint, it's very limited to lens spaces and rational homologies here. And the reason for this is, uh, it comes from algebraic geometry. Uh, what's so special about lens spaces and homologies here is that corresponding Calabi Gauss have very interesting topology changing transition. And the problem about uh, the question of how can you extend homonal homology and its generalizations to other three manifolds in this framework gets related to another question which hasn't been answered in all the graph geometry of which Calabi-Yaus have certain type of topology change in transition. The answer exists and is known for uh, Calabi-Yaus corresponding to lens spaces, but it's not known in general. So that's why so far I see here that this program has been limited only to lens spaces. But let me explain how it works. The slogan is that roughly everything you have in three dimensions gets kind of complexified. So we'll be talking, uh, in other words, three manifolds in real low dimensional uh, topology and geometry will correspond to three manifolds, but in the complex world. So three manifold M, where we want to put our knot, corresponds to a certain Calabial threefold X. And instead of explaining the general principle, let me just give you an example. 
The simplest three manifold is a three sphere. And you can think of a three sphere as glued from two disks, three dimensional disks, say on the north pole and south pole glued together. It corresponds to the simplest non trivial Calabria, which is likewise glued of three patches of C3, complex three dimensional space. Uh, this particular Calabria is O minus 1 plus O minus 1 bundle over CP1. So the total space of this bundle is of complex dimension 3, real dimension 6, of course. And it has one interesting topological non trivial cycle, namely the CP1 position. Uh, also, it's a very special Calabria because it's a typical local neighborhood of any other Calabria in the vicinity of CP1 uh, cycle. So this is in the dictionary, which um, I'm trying to explain first, uh, what corresponds to a three sphere. For instance, so, so yes. oh, this is a light bundle with first train class minus one. Yeah, over CP1. Oh, one. So, for, so uh, this is three complex dimensional because this is CP1 as one complex dimensional, then you have two lines. But the bundle is not real, it's twisted a little bit, and minus one tells us how exactly it is twisted. So in this notation, for example, anti-canonical bundle or tangent bundle will be O minus two. If you look at the geometry from the complex viewpoint, from the from the algebra. So this is an open packed Calabria. It's a two-dimensional, complex dimensional space, fiber for C1. So it has the guts of the Calabria in this case. Or uh, is the CP1 cycle? Is this other way to uh, associate this with manifold to its closely anti-planned? It's closely related, exactly. So, um, although I wasn't planning to explain it here, the rule is that the following. We can take three manifold M, associate to it to tangent bundle, and then ask, does it have a topology changing transition where three cycle M, which was obviously present in the total space of the tangent bundle, uh, gets transformed into even dimensional cycles, such as CP1 here. And as I said, now the right geometry, the answer to this question is known in affirmative only for length space. Uh, if it was for monomial three manifolds, we would probably try to see what happens there. But that's exactly the answer you get for a three sphere. If you take T star of S3, uh, indeed it can have a transition, topology changing transition preserving the Calabial condition and everything else to uh, this principle here. So that's exactly, so that's the secret how, how it comes about. I wasn't planning to say this, but if you apply the same rule, for example, to RP3, start with T star of RP3 and follow it through the transition, you obtain anti-canonical bundle over here to group surface. So for people familiar with toric diagrams, this is how the toric fan of this Calabial looks like. And it's again a three-dimensional complex geometry now wheeled out of Kirsberg surface, which uh, F0 says that it's actually trivial vibration, so it's actually CP1 cross CP1. And again, the message to take home from this is three manifold translates to a threefold. But this is just an ambient space. Let's put knots in the front. So a knot sitting inside three manifold corresponds to something, something sitting inside. Um, Columbia space X, and a natural thing to consider, and actually that's what in fact what, what we should do, is a Lagrangian manifold somehow determined by the knot K. How exactly it is determined, uh, physicists have their own way to think about it, but mathematical description perhaps is best explained in a paper of Taubes, who said that we can construct Lagrangian manifold in our O minus 1 plus O minus 1 over P1 out of the knot K by the following three step procedure. First, let's do something that we always do in a three-dimensional topology or one-dimensional topology. We'll construct Lagrangian twofold, determined by the knot K, in C2. That's very easy to do. We just think of C2 uh, as boundary of C2 as a three sphere, where we put our knot K, given by the picture here, and extend it to four dimensions. So, of course, uh, identifying C2 with a four ball, uh, we get ambient space and then continuum uh, the knot inside C2 uh, gives us a surface which can be made Lagrangian in C2. So that's that's a very standard 
uh, procedure, what we get is a two-dimensional surface bounded by the knot k sitting inside complex two-dimensional state. So once we have this, and if it's Lagrangian, the rest is trivial. Because we can take this C2 here, it has a with O minus 1, and then notice that what we get is exactly the fiber of our space X that I described to you a moment ago. And then we can easily promote this Lagrangian space in two dimensions to Lagrangian 3 manifold by composing L2 with equator of the CP1. So CP1 is a two sphere, and we can extend uh, this to a nice vibration whose fibers are these two dimensional Lagrangians that fracted in step one, and whose base is the equator of CP1. In this way, you get a Lagrangian threefold uh, sitting in the LRDM space. So, again, you'll probably forget details of this construction, which you can look at field state for, but the slogan is that three manifold gets promoted to a threefold. Now, not sitting inside three manifold becomes by this dictionary. Uh, Lagrangian three manifold in, um, in F. It has a nice property, which in fact is easy to see from uh, Mike's previous question, um, that geometry of X asymptotically is conical, and more specifically, it's a cone over S2 cross S3. It's a Calabi L threefold. It's of real dimension six, and therefore it's a cone on a five manifold, which is S2 cross S3. In fact, S3 here is nothing but the three sphere where we try to deal with our knots. And Lagrangian's manifold that we're constructing in this way, say, following the Higgs procedure, is asymptotically a cone on S1, which is a equator of S2, and cone K, which is our knot, inside S3. So this is a two dimensional manifold, and cone on this will be some three dimensional space. Okay. So that's what uh, one of the properties, and in particular, even though three sphere is not visible in the geometry of Calabia, it's visible uh, at the base uh, of the asymptotic region. Now, the first question is, what are we counting? I described to you the setup, and what are we counting depends on who you ask. If you ask a mathematician, uh, mathematics answer, which is precise and deserves its own series of lectures, is we're counting some version of Matthias Donaldson and Thomason. If you ask a physicist, you'll get an answer that they're counting so-called refined BPS inverse. All of this sounds very esoteric, and I definitely don't want to go into a detailed description of either of this, although, as I say, uh, both of these subjects deserve their own the lectures of their own. And I'll try to explain to you in simple, plain English uh, what exactly is being counted and give kind of flavor for what this material DT invariance are or what physicists call three prime DTS inverse. Once we have a problem where three manifold is translated to Calabial and not as translated to Lagrangian and manifold, it's an ideal problem for counting curves or minimal surfaces, J homomorphic curves, uh, with these boundary conditions and this data. In other words, uh, by this dictionary, which um, here at this point is a little imprecise, but good enough for the purposes of this talk, generators of the triply graded homology that we encountered in the very beginning will correspond to minimal surfaces sitting inside Calabial with boundary condition on the Lagrangian threefold. So that's a very natural counting problem, and that's actually the one which leads to, to the answer, um, in particular for the opening that we saw before. Um, here, a slightly more precise version of this answer is the following. Sometimes these curves, the minimal surfaces, come in families. And in that case, you should, of course, ask for their moduli space. Their moduli space is labeled by the genus of the minimal surface. It's also labeled by the degree. Namely, in our Columbia, we had one two-dimensional cycle, and the curve, minimal surface, can wrap that two-dimensional cycle, say, relative to the Lagrangian. And the present problem is one dimensional, so the cohomology of the moduli space here has three numbers attached to it, and these are exactly three gradients we saw before. One corresponds to the genus, another corresponds to the degree, and then, of course, there is a homological gradient. So this counting problem is similar to Gromov-Witton invariants and how Gromov-Witton invariants are defined, but there is a crucial distinction. 
Uh, in Bronco Fit Theory, we're counting stable maps. And that's why sometimes the numbers which come out are rational numbers, not integers. Here, we're counting embedded surfaces. So really, surfaces which you see inside, this is very similar to the definition of Gromov invariance that Lee Cloud used, for example, in uh, relation to cyber Clinton theory. Moreover, to make a nice deformation theory out of this curve counting, we have to treat them with a little bit of nice structure. But in the end, you get very well-defined enumerative uh, geometry problem, which again has life of its own. This is what uh, many people work on, including uh, Donaldson, Thomas, and uh, their followers. So in the present case, it just uh, leads to this uh, three-dimensional, uh, sorry, three triply graded uh, probability here. Moreover, in this dictionary, between uh, three-dimensional problem and the corresponding algebraic geom geometry problem, there is a nice translation between information about geometry of the knot and geometry of the corresponding uh, Riemann surface. It just happens that genus of the knot K translates to the genus of the Riemann surface sigma. To make this a little bit more precise, uh, let me recall uh, the definition of the cipher genus and its role in not your homology. Not, not your homology, which categorifies Alexander Planar, let's say for the triple knot, has three generators, and it has the following property that maximal value of the grading, Q grading in the not your homology uh, is exactly the cipher genus of the knot. So in the case of the trifoil, which has three-dimensional not your homology, there are three generators, the maximal value of the Q grading is one. And that reflects the fact that cipher genus of the trefoil is equal to one. So the same or something similar happens in the geometric problem involving uh, curve counting. The maximal genus of the curve that uh, contributes to, to this enumerative invariance also happens to correspond to the cube grading and therefore happens to um, be nicely identified uh, with a genus in a different sense. Uh, it's even, uh, it's nice that the word genus uh, here has the same meaning or uh, relates the three-dimensional topology to the uh, curve counting in the, in the other. Now, if you apply, if you start, start with this setup and, uh, for example, try to uh, count this uh, curves in a Calabi-Yellow space, you obtain a three-dimensional space uh, also, there are three generators corresponding to three types of curves, which I uh, roughly explained in the previous slide. So you already see that uh, here there is a nice match in the dimension, and then a nice property um, of this uh, triply graded homology is that, or it's concurrent anomaly if you do some specialization, in this case set A equals T inverse, you actually recover the concurrent anomaly of the not your homology. So this triply graded theory that uh, comes from curve counting actually knows not only about SLM not homology, but it can be extended uh, and has some relation to the not your homology as well. As this example is here. Now, life is not always that simple. So in the case of the trefoil, uh, we had very nice match between uh, counting some objects in the Calabial space and for example, not curve homology, and specialization A equals T inverse gave us precise relation, just like it worked before for Ovanov homology and its other versions. But this is a more interesting example, which comes from uh, three, four torus knot. It has eight crossings, and is the first example where some interesting things are appearing. Here, one of the things that you can notice is the numerative problem gives you a space, strictly graded homology, which is much bigger than not curve homology. And some of the terms uh, that you see on the right hand side, which come from curve counting, do reproduce the correct terms in the not curve homology here, defined by Osler, Dahl, by Rasmussen. So, in particular, doing the specialization A equals T inverse, we do reproduce correct polynomial, but then there are some additional terms which are kind of left over. But once you ask about uh, these leftover terms, uh, you immediately notice that they come in pairs. So, uh, and 
the pairs which are equally spaced in all the three gradients, in Q gradient, in A gradient, and in the T gradient, which is not illustrated on this picture. In fact, uh, all of the leftover terms can be killed by differentials, um, in this case, the corresponding differential is called V0, and the notation that we use in the three for the trans is not redundant in the cross-system. And this is actually a more part of a more general story, which we see here, that reflects how this three-dimensional, strictly graded homology should be related to Tesselenov homology uh, in general. Indeed, in that right-hand side of this column, we don't have polynomials. We have homology groups, which are strictly graded here and um, doubly graded here. And if you want to specialize, instead of taking a, Q to the, a equals q to the n, which corresponds to identifying some gradients, in general, what you have to do, you have to take a homology with respect to some differential. So this strictly graded theory comes with a bunch of differentials, one for each n, such that they commute with each other, and such that relative homology of h with respect to the n gives you the corresponding SLN version. So we can work out the corresponding um, the corresponding gradients. So this is a gradient, q gradient, and t gradient. And uh, from the structure of the theory, we can conclude that there are such differentials. And this is essentially what I explained. If you take uh, the homology with respect to dn, you obtain SLM not homology for n equals 2, 3, and so on. You obtain not for homology for n equals 0. And uh, for n equals 1, you expect that you should get some kind of SL1 homology, but SL1 is a trivial theory. Such differentials should have the property that uh, differential V1 in our notation should have the property that its cohomology is one dimensional or trivial, corresponding to the fact that quantum SL1 is very important. Another interesting feature of the story is that you get differentials not only for positive values of n, but also for negative values of n. So in fact, you get differentials for all possible integers. So this is how the picture looks for the pair formula. These are some canceling differentials, e1, d minus 1, that acting on the triple graded theory uh, produce um, one-dimensional leftover pieces which are trivial. There are no other differentials. And this is the picture of this complicated knot with a crossings, three, four torus knot, which actually has lots of differentials. It has three differentials uh, corresponding to them, which because homology gives you a not for homology, it also has various canceling differentials and so on and so forth. So the picture gets quite interesting um, as you go to more complicated. Now, in the remaining uh, couple of minutes, let me give you a rough picture of where these differentials come from and uh, what is their meaning. In the original definition of Hovanov and Rosansky of SLM not homology, uh, it's, it's kind of low code. You try to associate a particular building block, very much like in quantum invariance, you associate quantum power matrix to every crossing in an algebra. Here, you associate an algebraic object known as matrix factorization. By definition, matrix factorization is a two-step uh, two complex. It involves, it's a periodic complex which involves terms m0 and m1, continuous periodicity and differentials d0, d1, such that they don't square to 0. That would make it into a cyclic complex. But they square to identity uh, in the endomorphism algebra uh, of a certain uh, polynomial, and a certain polynomial algebra times a function w. w is usually called a potential. And in the case of SLM homology that Kovanov and Radansky studied, the potential has very simple form. It's monomial x to the n plus 1, in particular it has a critical point at the origin in the x plane of multiplicity n. So that's what's responsible for SLM. That's how it comes. We can also construct various potentials for other groups and representations, um, in particular for, say, symmetric, anti-symmetric representations of SLM or even for some exceptional groups from which you can infer various interesting relations in uh, homological invariance of knots uh, relating different ranks and different types of representations. 
for example, this relation here works for the unknot, and I don't know if it works for a general knot. I suspect that uh, there might be a nice relation because for the unknot, something interesting happens. It works for all k's and all m's. Uh, the dimensions of the groups are the same, but the ring structure is different. So there might be uh, some hint for interesting connections uh, of homologies associated to different representations of groups. But coming back to the problem of these differentials, uh, they correspond to deformations of the potential. So this potential and matrix factorization for basic building blocks of Ovalov and Rosalski homology. And if you try to deform the story, it turns out that such deformation by monotonals of lower degree uh, leads to, it of course splits the critical point of multiplicity and into critical point of lower multiplicity by some leftover pieces which don't contribute to the homology. And as studied by uh, Lee, Bornick, and, and many other people, such deformations lead to spectral sequences which are essentially responsible for these differentials that we saw before. So the story gets much more interesting if you look, for example, at SOSP. So the corresponding potential has the following form. It's um, of the same type where you have monomial x with some power n related to the ring. Plus, now the potential depends on two variables, x and y. And you have this standard d type SO potential, uh, which is <coughs> monomial x, y squared. Now, deformations of this potential are much more interesting. Uh, some of them reduce the rank if you deform by monomial x to the m, where m is low, uh, less than n, you essentially go from SLN homology to SLN homology as before. But now there are all kind of special deformations due to the fact that you have a variable y here. So some of them completely split the critical point of multiplicity n into non-degenerate critical points. And they lead to homology, which is one-dimensional. Some of them have interesting properties. And for example, this plus term here, what it does is it essentially gets rid of the variable y. If you deform the potential by this monomial y squared, what you're left with is essentially the matrix factorization for potential x to the n minus 1. And if you remember, that was exactly what Hovanov and Rosansky used for SLN homology. So this differential, which corresponds to the deformation, is kind of universal and it has the property which that relates a so theory to a SLM theory. And this is indeed true. You can uh, check it, for example, in the simplest case of the trefoil, which was our baby example before. We see that now a SOSP homology is much more interesting. It has uh, lots of non-trivial differentials, and these green ones are these universal differentials whose cohomology gives us uh, SLM theory or the verification of the home theory. For instance, let's look at the differential which goes to the right. It would kill these two points, these two generators, it would kill these two generators, and these two. So we're left with three pieces, three terms, which are precisely the three terms in the home theory homology of the trefoil that we had before. So there is a very intricate structure of the differentials. They have specific A, Q, and T grading, and it's quite amazing that all of the terms that get canceled obey uh, the general rule, and the structure is very consistent. Now, um, in this differential, there is something strange. Uh, I explained to you, based on matrix factorizations, uh, the meaning of this differential for positive n, but they actually exist even for uh, negative range of n, which uh, at first may be a little bit strange. However, if we go back to this geometric problem, you notice that the degree um, of the curve which is being counted uh, can be positive or negative, and that's essentially um, the 
as we have been seeing. So the differentials which we saw before and the phenomenon that uh, quickly graded homology jumps or changes sometimes if you look very end is nothing but the wall crossing phenomenon. In this category, what happens is that if you vary m, which is the stability parameter, sometimes as the object which was contributing to h and was stable may become unstable, and therefore what you encounter is, is a wall crossing. Plus, now in addition, you see that uh, going from positive m to negative m is nothing but the flop transition and the the algebra. And at the volume of CP1, we simply go to to the other phase of the, of the flow plot. Uh, here uh, in SLM, you didn't have uh, much, much interesting going on, but in SOSP version, actually what happens is that the SOS series corresponds to positive values of n, and SP <coughs> homology corresponds to negative values of n. So um, here, positive and negative are really different and quite interesting. Um, Plus, again, to this wall crossing phenomena, uh, you can actually describe by the work of Hans-Henry uh, Slaberman and many people who followed it how the space of what they call BPS invariants or Matilda Thomas and Thomas invariants would change. And again, you would be able to reproduce all the differentials, for instance. This is one uh, example of a simple formula which comes from uh, this area of mathematics that has quantum dimension in there. And, uh, tells how, how such change can possibly happen. So uh, again, the uh, lesson to take home is that um, this is a very uh, rich picture which connects this uh, different interpretation of non homologies and a completely different area of math which has life of its own and has the potential of unifying different homology theories. So we saw the connection between St. Lothar homology and Hovano homology um, by the strictly graded theory, uh, which explains many experimental observations, patterns, for example, uh, between the relation between dimensions and range of this theory. And um, that's perhaps the most important uh, lesson that we can take home. So in the end, of course, I want to uh, thank my for inspiration and I wish you a happy birthday.